until we define those gaps and 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 look at what information's out there, right? What pro products are out there, the HEMS tool, whatever. It's really kind of incumbent on us to, to determine the gaps and and then uh, look at what you know what could potentially fill those gaps. Will current information fill those gaps? Will it not be sufficient enough? Take um, uh, I guess what Rex did last um, last FPA, for example, he uh, he gave a great presentation and it showed the gaps in weather information in what they what he identified was the urban canyon, um, and and that that really that 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 points out a lot of things, right? Even within an area where you would have an ASOS that would cover, you know, Chicago, for example, um, there still isn't sufficient enough information to you know to operate in in all those areas safely under all conditions. So what are the gaps? And that, that's really what the research starts with. And, and uh, on the subject of test sites, Don Bershoff, you uh, had some uh, comment or comments on uh, test sites. Well, since Don's Don our next speaker, um, maybe we ought to, maybe we ought to, uh, yeah. or or one of the couple of next speakers, maybe we ought to wait till uh, till he's he's queued could up you, and then we can go from there. Could you hear me? No, no, no Don. now we can. Yeah, yeah. No, I was yeah. you, I was muted. Um, so you know the test sites, the ones that are really being focused now in the next phase of UPP two. Do you guys understand the UTM, FAA UTM? Uh, project plan two which is a follow-up to upp1 that occurred about a year ago um there's two test sites now that have been selected for that um universe uh, virginia and new york and faa is is uh, awarding contract now for those test sites to do um second level type utm activities in crowded airspace and in urban environment and uh, i think syracuse is going to be the urban environment that they're looking at doing some testing so um you guys probably should get caught up on that if kevin if you're not aware that came out only two days ago and um yeah i saw that yeah so the key there is it's going to be now um you know how you guys decide you want to use that vehicle right in the weather side and um i think uh you know, there's a lot of opportunity to test some of the VWAS stuff under very controlled conditions now in those two test ranges and um, and also test some other capabilities. I think we shouldn't limit it just to the VWAS because it's still pretty expensive and we could talk about that in my my presentation. But the other test sites formerly are Grand Forks up in North Dakota, well, North Dakota, Lone Star in Texas, uh, the Nevada test range, um there's a uh new york there's um a um alaska and um one more I'm, I'm, i can't kind of remember them all but those are the main fa ones and then you have the ipp sites that where justin is working out in north carolina uh, around raleigh i'm not sure those are those are probably not going to get the same level of money from faa to develop testing in those areas because the test ranges like New York have already have like a full radar, uh, ground radar for specifically built for UAS uh, remote uh, tracking and ID. So this is getting more advanced now, right? They want to they want to test this remote ID testing, and so they have the ground radar for de for that. So you're going to see more uh, testing done in areas that have better um, equipment for tracking small drones and you know all that kind of stuff. Right. Okay. Well, if um, if we've exhausted the questions, um, it's uh, th this is a perfect segue into, I think, uh, Don's uh, presentation. But Gordy, back back to you first. Yeah. No, that this has been great. Uh, thanks for everyone for the feedback and uh, keep thinking along those lines because Don uh, Birchoff. Uh, uh, has graciously agreed to um, present uh, at our request and really the focus what we're looking for is you know what what are the what is the industry doing uh, as Kevin uh, pointed out eloquently pointed out we are behind the power curve we are very behind the power curve 
trying to get a handle on this um, and establish any sort of weather standards for UAS. Well, we know the industry's done a lot of a lot of very good things, but it needs to be cost effective too. And and we know the VWAS is not cost effective to roll out to every every location. But you know, we, we got to keep our eye on the ball and, and not just fix one part of aviation. We want to we want a, a, a total solution here. So uh, that's one of the things the FAA has always looked at is is we need to look at all all the all the operators. And so, you know, there's there's definitely some some potential here. Um, but anyway, Don, uh, you're up. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm assuming you're going to flip the slides um, for us. I I um I'm I your really slide flipper, Don. This is Matt, but, oh, but only if you show your video. If you don't show your video, I don't flip your slide. Uh, okay. All right. Here we go. You can see my long hair. All right. Um. So thank you everyone. First of all, I want to say that I'm really impressed that I think we've made a lot of progress since the last FPA meeting. Uh, I really believe that, you know, folks like Marilyn Pearson and Kevin Johnston and the work they're doing and Gordy and, and uh, you know, we, we are starting to see now the, um, the integration of industry, academia and, um, and, the, and the government coming together on this. And this is not, again, this is not going to be a government show. This is going to be uh, a multi uh, pronged show because the challenges that we have to meet here are not, you know, nobody can has all the capabilities to do it on their own, right? So um, I think that's going to be the success here. And, you know, as they, as they spoke earlier, I, you know, there was some really good presentations earlier today that I really was taking note of because um, I am thinking about, you know, being the guy that used to worry about this stuff, I do think about how we're going to solve more than one problem as we try to increase the um, our, our capabilities to have more ubiquitous sensing in the boundary layer and how that translates into, you know, picking up more microclimate effects that are going to be really critical for the UAS. But we also know helicopters, you know, we still know we don't have the best capabilities there, right? I mean, people still get in trouble like we saw in California. And and so the question becomes, how do we, um, you know, move the whole industry forward in better weather and take advantage of the UAS opportunity that says, hey, you know, we do need better capability. So and 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 we have a requirement now that's harder. So let's take advantage of that requirement to drive improvement across the board. And so the V the VWAS thing, you know, that's that's a really good initiative, and I like the idea of the cameras. Um, and I'm still concerned about the cost, right? I think honestly, if we don't get those down to like 10,000 each, um, at least 10,000, then um, we're not going to see the kind of coverage that I think is going to be necessary to really support the UAS industry at the level that, I mean, you know, we'll always make do with what we have, right? What will happen is we'll just wind up having more uncertainty and we'll wind up grounding people more or increasing the risk of flight. And then by grounding them, we're gonna impact their, their ROI. We're gonna impact the industry's ability to make money. Um, these are not big margin industry right now. And uh, so yeah, we'll always survive with what we have. The question is, is are we, you know, how's the industry then gonna be able to grow and really reach its full potential if, if we um, cannot do a better job of, of getting the uncertainty uh, down and, and creating more certainty in the boundary layer. So that's kind of, you know, I think my focus, um, you know, I've taken this on kind of as a cause because I, you know, have the government background experience and the, I understand the labs and I understand the private sector now and I understand the industry and I'm trying to see how we can just bring everything together, right, and get a real good effect. Next slide. So, you know, this this slide here I always show because it's really important to always remind ourselves that the current capabilities that we have in our in our uh, aviation weather services um, do not work for the UAS industry. And um, this was the FAA uh, Lincoln Lab study. And I, you know, I'm not going to, uh, you know, we're not going to uh, continue to drive this home, but I would say that and when you get into the urban environments, it even gets it's even worse, right? Um, so we we just need to keep in mind that this is our this is our grading. This is where we are right now as an industry, as a weather industry, in our grading for the UAS. And this doesn't really give us the micro grading scale for the urban canyons. Next slide. So what what is it I've seen? You know, we 
two others now have been two years in the test ranges. We've been supporting real operations. We're actually supporting a flight today, actually tonight, tomorrow in Korea. They're flying uh, some masks uh, from the main island south of Korea to some small islands. And we, you know, we ran some micro model stuff for them and they're gonna be collecting data for us. And, you know, what we're, we're really starting to learn about impacts of wind aloft, um, even in visual line of sight, you know, the threats are the invisible threats. Um, it's not, you know, we all could see precipitation come in. We all, you know, they can get them down in time. If they see precipitation, but the issues are what's really going on at, you know, 200, 300 feet. And, you know, when you see, you know, I like to call them treetop inversions, uh, you know, especially in North Carolina. We, some of us are meteorologists that have a lot of experience forecasting East Coast and understand cold air damming and low level jets and, and they really set up nicely in North Carolina. And sometimes it could be two, 300 feet above the ground, you know, at three at 30 knots, and it could be calm at the surface. And we've seen some of that in uh, New York. We actually had an accident due to it, and it was a crashing inversion coming down from 2,000 feet. Originally, we had a pyrep at Syracuse at 6 a.m. of wind shear at 2,000 feet, 30 knots. It was a really interesting inversion. It was very strong. I was very surprised that it even set up as strong as it did. But what happened is um, folks went out to the airfield. They did everything the part 107 said you're supposed to do. They they were at Griffiths, so they had an ASOS. Uh, they, they had their handheld Kestrel and they went out at 10 o'clock. We had warned them about the inversion and that was gonna come down. They flew two missions up to like 150 feet, no issues, winds were calm. And then in the third mission, they hit 100 feet and the inversion was coming down and they nailed it. And uh, the rotaries from that inversion overtook the aircraft's ability to, you know, air, be airworthy and it crashed. And, you know, from my perspective, this is going to be, you know, one of the more significant dangers uh, that we're going to see because you can't see it, right? And we don't have enough data to capture it. Next slide. So, you know, it all starts with observations, and this is uh, from the World Meteorological Society. You know, this is a great image of our sensing suites that we have out there. We, it takes a village, right? No one's sensor answers. You can't, you know, you have to have, uh, you know, latency, you have to have aerial coverage, you have to have, um, Right. I mean, it's just and you have to blend them in a way that's going to give you the best picture of the atmosphere. And remember, when it comes to UAS, it's not about the surface data. Uh, it's more about what's going on aloft. And most big airplanes, they, they, you know, the inversions are a bump. Right. But in this case, they're not bumps. And um, and those winds are also impact battery power and how far they can fly. And, you know, I'm not going to say that they're going to go up there and fly a mission and run out of battery because they're, they're not aware of the winds, but if they have a mission plan and they're trying to make money as a company and they can't, they get it up there and the winds are stronger than they expected, they've just lost money. And the other thing is, is it does happen where they crash them. Off of North Carolina last month, the emergency managers flew a, uh, a DJI drone off the water, off of North Carolina beach. And they had, uh, they went out and they were doing their stuff and they came back they had a 15 knot headwind and they had to crash it in the water shore to shore because they uh, didn't know that the winds were that strong and they didn't account for the distance. And this was visual line of sight. So again, you know, it is about the data. We need better data. Models will get us so far. Somebody this morning talked about RTMA. Hey, look, I'm a big RTMA fan, all right? But RTMA is based off of an analysis of a model and it's not necessarily real time in situ data and what we're finding is is when you're in these valleys and you're in these areas where there's no observations and the model is sub and the area subgrid to the model um it's you know you, you can get caught with your pants down uh because of these the, the very the um the, the weather sensitivity of these small aircraft it, it is enough to cross you over a threshold next next slide so, you know, everybody, you know, everybody in this room is smart enough to know that there's solutions out there. Uh, you know, this is not going to surprise anyone, but the bottom, what I'm seeing right now is, you know, we really have got to open our mind to IoT data sets. And I think this morning, 
somebody, you know, said something that I, I, I wrote down uh, because I liked it and I wanted to drive it home. Um, they were talking about how the, um, you know, there's observation sites. He was talking about Duluth, I think, and there was observation sites that, you know, we know that the ceiling and visibility measurements aren't necessarily, you know, um, you know, the caliber of certification that we look for. Uh, but we also know the error rates and and that that data could still be useful in certain scenarios. And, and the same goes for other parameters coming off of that site. And I, I really believe we've just got to learn how to use data smartly. We've got to get off of this um, idea that we have to certify everything uh, to AWIS or you know uh, ASOS quality. We've got to think about how do we use um, data and calibrate it and and validate it and smooth it and figure out you know what's usable in what scenarios and have a risk-based approach to data because if we try to be perfect and we have one hundred and twenty thousand dollar VWASs, we're not going to solve this problem so um you know that's just one of my 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 things that i like to see us continue to think about how could we do that maybe that needs to be part of the research that Kevin's uh, pushing, right? Maybe we need to look at how we use IoT data sets, um, you know, and, um, and 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 make it useful to to what we need, right? Um, the you know we talked about cameras this morning, and I think it's really amazing, um, you know, uh, that Alaska, what you're doing up there, and I and I and I really like to see some of that camera technology, and. Uh, you know, I'd love to get some of that VWAS stuff in New York and other test ranges we're working in uh, because, you know, we can validate that stuff. We can use it in our uh, testing with the FAA and with other um, uh, operators. Uh, we use the Helios. We do use Helios in our system. Um, there's also uh, low cost observation sites, stations that might be good enough that don't have to be $120,000. It all depends on what you want to measure, right? Um, the weather drones, um, you know, is another uh, area that I'm, you know, we have a partnership with Meteo Drone in, in uh, Switzerland and and they were tested by uh, NOAA and my friend, my good friends uh, down at NSSL uh, and they they have 2500 hours flying beyond visual line of sight in Switzerland and they've already demonstrated that they can improve the forecast for ceiling and visibility around Zurich Airport and Meteo Swiss has written a, a paper about it. So. I mean, I'm not sure, you know, we can't have these everywhere, um, but, you know, I think they're part of the solution. And then you got GPS RO and commercial satellites. And again, we know GPS RO is attenuated in areas when it gets close to the surface, but, you know, again, it's part of the solution, right, uh, of trying to get uh, more observations, higher density, and, and we got to, you know, take advantage of those observations in a way that they just don't get lost in the model. Maybe there's a way that we can pull those that data and turn it into useful soundings or useful information to try to get us a better real time. Maybe it could be part of a 3D RTMA. I don't know. I'm just throwing ideas out. Next slide. So I think, um, you know, where I'm really encouraged right now is, again, uh, FAA, academia, and research and, and commercial coming together. And I think, you know, what I've really been trying to do for about a year now is get weather on the radar scope of the ASTM F-38. This is where all the standards for UAV, UAS in the United States, and it's being actually, um, you know, introduced around the world. They're considered like, we're considered a leader and, and in this, and uh, in Switzerland, they're using this and in other places. So it's a really important group. And they've been doing a lot of work on UTM standards, right? Like, you know, how are you gonna deconflict aircraft? How far apart do, do aircraft have to be? Um, you know, how are we gonna get two UAS traffic management service suppliers to be able to share information about the flights that they're bringing into the system from their users and making sure that they de-conflict with each other in, in, in a flight plan. Um, and, and again, the key point to drive home here is the FAA made a decision and NASA made a decision that they had to um, outsource and a federated approach to UTM. They had to do it because they knew that the FAA could not do all of that below 400 feet. And they built a system by which um, Class G airspace is basically gonna get 
uh, I won't say managed because the FAA doesn't like that word because they manage everything, but it'll be uh, monitored and surveilled and the users will be getting services from these UTMs who will then tie back into the, um, the, uh, the ATM system, right? And around areas where you have um, airports, there's a land, it's called Lance, and there's another method there to kind of deconflict manned aircraft. And there's a whole bunch of this stuff being developed. And I've been sitting in these meetings for almost two years, and I really understand that what they're trying to do. And I've been dying to say, hey, look, when are we going to get weather into this? So finally, um, about four months ago, uh, Phil Cano, who, who used to be NOAA uh, in charge of, I think, the whole NOAA fleet, um, he runs the ASTM and he got us, you know, he, he agreed to take this forward. And, and um, we put together a group. Um, right now we have about 30 and it's open to anyone. And we had our first meeting as part of the ASTM F-38 virtual annual meeting. Uh, and we actually had our own session. And we have uh, people from Airbus, um, Peter Sachs. We have Ted Lester from GE Aeros. We have uh, Justin is on there from UPS. We have Jeff Massey from Amazon. We have Uber, uh, Rohit, and we have um, many other outsiders that are not just weather, but we have industry in there with weather. And um, we're now, and, and proudly we got Kevin and Marilyn on there and, they're, and they were a huge component of helping us. We actually drafted the first terms of reference that are gonna help us become a group and hopefully be accepted by the XCOM the, uh, uh, to be a group. And then in that group, we will be broken up into working groups and starting to develop recommended standards and performance standards for weather for the UAS industry. And we'll be doing it in the same construct that the rest of the UAS industry is doing it in. So we're like at the table with the big boys. And we are now getting pulled in. I just got an email today from another group that said, hey, we need to start bringing the weather piece, weather subgroup into this other group at UTM. And, and so the point is, is that we'll be working to develop these standards with the FAA, with NASA, with anybody, and then We'll have to, you know, develop a consensus and develop a, a first um, draft of these standards. It's, you know, we're not going to solve world hunger in the first round. We, what we've got to do is we've got to try to be innovative enough to move the ball down the court, but not too uh, far reaching that we can't execute, right, what we need to execute. And so that's what we're working on. And you're all welcome to join us. And I think that, um, again, um, this is really a big deal for the weather industry to be at this table with the big with the big boys. And um, so we need to, you know, encourage everybody to, to get involved, to help us. And let's, you know, let's also, this is going to drive requirements. And these requirements will drive research money. And, you know, this is how we can really have an effect on the system. Next slide. So, you know, I just, again, I, I, I just wanted to talk about the importance of micro weather predictions. And again, you know, when we talked this morning about RTMA, we talked about LAMP, we talked about challenges in Alaska with, with subgrid, with sub, subgrid um, ceiling and visibility predictions when you only have one station and it's driving the whole problem. You know, we got a lot of things to work, but, um, you know, I think the, the, the key point of this slide is to demonstrate again the three kilometer her on the left around Blacksburg, Virginia. You know, this is the same uh, model on the right. We use the same name list as the her, and you can see it's starting to pull out the mountains and the valley winds. And this is all hidden right now. If you, you know, and when people go out and they fly and they go, those weather guys, they really suck. I mean, geez, these winds are, you know, 14 knots at to at 80 meters, not, you know, seven knots or whatever. And they get really upset because the batteries, you know, and, and, and they, you know, that's like a 50% reduction in flight time. And it's not because we're not that good. It's just that they're not getting what they need because we can't, you know, we're not producing it and getting it out. And, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm really trying to drive home is, you know, people are going to have to start paying for better weather information. It's just not going to be free, you know, and, and that if it's it, it, it's going to become a business model for them where, look, if you guys 
you guys are worried about your ROI and keeping your aircraft up in the air, you're going to have to pay for better weather data. And it costs money to run these models. It's not free. And it's not going to come from the government in the time frame that you care about. So, you know, this is where we need to you know, start looking at how we get user fees into the UTM system. And, you know, we start getting folks to pay for these. And this is why the private sector has to be part of, you know, the SDSP, because the private sector can uh, be agile enough to um, fuse a lot of different data sets, make it available in the formats needed, do the decision tools, and even run these all their own micro models that can help at least in the interim period until we build the Uber, you know, weather model that comes from somewhere, right? Um, we know if we don't if we don't encourage the private sector to take that role, then we're going to be lagging behind our capabilities that we could deliver to this industry, and we're just gonna, you know, we're gonna hurt them, and we're gonna hurt our own, our own reputation. Next slide. And this is just an example of some products that they like. Like they love the, the route cast on the left. This is a product where you can take their waypoints and and they take off landing and height and altitude. And we, you know, we produce this uh, using the micro model data for and it really it also gives them an optimized route. And it, you know, when you're really getting down to you know five knots of wind plus or minus, that can really hurt a mission. They, you know, they really appreciate when you can uh, do this kind of stuff. Next slide. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the main points is, is that everything that we're doing in this industry is all new, which is really good, right? We don't, like I, you know, I've worked in, you know, manned aviation industry. I've, I know how, you know, if you had to, you know, work in United or Delta and you have all those old software systems and, you know, if you wanted to get weather integrated into a interface, you know, it would be, you know, take an act of Congress and, you know, a billion dollars in two years because you had to rewrite the code and all that. But, you know, the, the, the times have changed and everything is built on modern architecture. You know, we have open data sources, open data sets. You know, we're going to use the X, AXTM standard for API, at, you know, which is the same standard. You know, AT, AXTM is what we use, you know, in uh, manned aviation. Um, you know, the SAS cloud standards are starting to come together and, you know, doing this is not rocket science and um what we don't want to do is put up our own in turn our own artificial hurdles because of our you know whatever because of our culture or because of our the way we've done business for the last 40 years you know we've really got to you know break the paradigm on this and um you know there are companies weather companies that are doing this right now and 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 so we just need to be uh, thinking about how do we take the um, the best of the government, the best of the academia and research and the best of the private sector? And how do we come up with a roadmap that we know as an industry three plus three plus three equals 20? And, you know, even on the research side, as Kevin was talking about this morning, we don't want to do research we don't need to do. We need to focus on where the gaps are, what the private sector can do and what they can't do, what the government can do and they can't do, and then go to the research and say, this is what we need. Because if we start having stovepipe programs that are just going out there doing research willy nilly because it's a fun thing to do or it's, you know, it's exciting, we're not putting our resources against the, you know, the biggest need and it's not coming together as an industry and we need to do that. Next slide. And of course, you know, this is Mateus, you know, this is his big thing, of course, like mine, you know, what are we going to do about this problem, right? And there's a lot here to deal with. Um, this is a this is not a good problem. We really don't have an operational system that can turn stuff around like this and be reliable and do it in, you know, at every, in every city across the world, right? We don't have that and we got to build that, you know, quite frankly. Next slide. And, you know, we know what the challenges in the urban terrain is. And I tell you, know, I talk to Uber. I've talked to these guys. I know what their business model is. I know what their, um, how far out in the future they need to worry about stuff. I know the kind of things they're worried about. And, um, you know, we just, you know, we need to be focusing on the right problems is what I'm saying, right? Like in the, in the major cities, you know, the heat island effect is huge, right? So if you're flying from Manhattan to JFK, you're going to go from Manhattan in August. You could be going from, you know, skin temperatures of 130, 140 degrees in the sun uh, over uh, the bay 
uh, in Brooklyn, where temperature is now 70 degrees, and then you know landing at JFK. What about your density altitude in the cities? What about your weight? How many people are you going to put in that aircraft? Are you going to put those the, the weight of those people in that in that EV tile based on the the temperature at JFK? Which, so now you're making your plan for weight based on the wrong temperature, right? Um, you got to you got to think about all these things that are not something we normally think about in this industry and in this what and in the aviation industry. Next slide. So that's um, that was my spiel for today. I hope it was helpful. Um, and um, you know, if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to contact me, or you know, we can answer questions now. Whatever you want to do. Thank you. Yeah, we, yeah, we had, had, that have been some here. Here. Uh, uh, David Kovachar is asking, asking uh, uh, are UAS pilots uh, able to use vertical wind profiler data to monitor low level winds? Well, how, I guess the question would be yes, if you had it in a format that they can use and ingest and manipulate. And, you know, remember when you're a UAS pilot, you may have somebody who has been a manned aviator or maybe never been a manned aviator. You have people who um, may have had no weather training other than the part 107 weather training, which is not at all relevant to what they're trying to do. So you got to think about it's not the data necessarily. I mean, yeah, of course, if you had vertical profiler data, it'd be awesome, right? But we don't want to give vertical weather profiler data to the end user. We've got to find a way to get it packaged and delivered in a way that they're going to be able to use it, integrate it, understand it and make use of it. So I think the answer, of course, is yes. But I think there's a lot there to you have to get, you know, to get that delivered is that's a big we're, we're not even close. It's a big it's a big lift. All right. And uh, Jeff Massey had a question about what are the weather sensing capabilities and accuracy of Meteodrome observations? Oh, well, I don't have all the specifications at my fingertips, but what I will tell you is that Noah published a paper on Meteodrome. It was it was uh, Steve Koch. Um, they that was all done independently, and um, and you could go to the website for Media Drone to read about the, um, the what they claim to be the specs. Now here's the thing: Media Drone has been now selected by the the uh, Joint Special Operations Command in the uh, military, so there's a vetting process there too, and the fact that they're gotten through that that vetting process. They're actually delivering several media drones here shortly. So, um, you know, I'm very convinced that that this is the the best drone that's commercially available that can have immediate operational impact. Let's put it that way. And uh, Justin Hiller did put a, a link on the uh, comment uh, on the meeting chat there. So uh, anybody that wants to go to that, the link uh, is uh, been posted on there. Um, and uh, Gary, uh, you had um, some comments, questions. Do you want to go ahead and just speak up, uh, uh, Gary, about um, I can user, imagine, uh, and, uh, user, user friendly? Yeah, I guess with all this, it's not just Don, but I heard him say some of the stuff in his briefing as well with UAS pilots has some weather products will be really good down in valleys, others will be good somewhere else. And I heard this, you know, with VWAS, how it's giving you certain things, but it may not be identical to an ASOS in certain cases. And my concern is, and I've, we've presented this before in the WIDIC program, the pilots with the products that we get, we've run tests with just some basic products out on avweather.gov, and they're not using them correctly as is. My fear is that some of these things really sound great for meteorologists and listening to a lot of these discussions, the Mets seem to know what all these are in RTMA and how you'd use it there. What's the method for how are you taking all these new all these new products coming on that are giving kind of the same information but for different specialties to make sure not just pilots, even dispatch and other people that are not Mets put them into a simple form that they really know these go no go decisions. Getting the information is great, but we've seen where a lot of the planning off this extra information sometimes doesn't do well. We showed some data last time where in 84 pilots, mm -hmm. not a single person using basic weather 
plan correctly. They all flew into the clouds on their planning using more basic products than what are being showed here. So I'm a little concerned that the, this is great for METs and maybe it'll help forecasting, but are UAS pilots, who I suspect probably may not be as good as GA or with weather, are really going to be savvy to know what to use when? Well, I think I think that's what I meant. I mean, that's why I said the vertical wind profile is useless to them, right? I mean, you know, we, you know, what I've been doing is working on these types of products you're talking about. We've been testing different uh, decision, go, no go decision products. Um, and thus far, they seem to work pretty well. Um, the best product is one that blends 20 different data sets into a simple no go, no go. And, you know, the military has been doing that for years. And so it's not like rocket science. But the thing is, is that the, the problem is, is that and again, I mean this is that I think the government needs to focus on helping get the standards right, get the data, you know, helping with the research, let the private sector work on the go, no go stuff because we're in the trenches and we're hearing that uh, all the, you know, we're building those capabilities and those are not hard to build, right? Once you know what the requirement is and with good data fusion tools, it's easy, you can build, you know, decision support tools that are very simple. It, it's really the challenge right now though is we just don't have good enough data and we need to focus, I think that's what, you know, we need the government and the research guys to focus on is how are we gonna get, you know, better information to put into those decision products. I, um, but I agree with you a hundred percent. I mean, you know, we can't confuse people with all this data. First of all, the other thing I wanna mention is this is gonna be a fully automated career field in five years. So there won't even be a pilot, um, you know, <laughs> The data is going to be all machine to machine and it's all going to have business analytic rules for managing the drones so you know it in the end it's really going to come down to the data and how it's it's used in these business analytics to make those decisions right so um, pilots are you know they're they're probably not going to be more than uh, at some point they'll be controlling 10 or 20 missions right uh in, at an op center somewhere and they'll be flying out of uh, drone boxes that are all automated. They can't take off and land by themselves. And um, they're not going to be following every mission. They're going to be focusing on, you know, having a tool set that's going to tell them where the adverse conditions are, where things are going wrong. And then the human's going to get involved in that process to, to, to do what they have to do. So we got to be thinking like that also, right? Thank you, uh, Gary. And uh, Andy's asking, uh, didn't helicopters have to deal with the same temperature uh, mismatch operating from Manhattan to JFK? How is that solved? Well, I'm gonna let, I can let Rex talk to that, but I will tell you that again, the weather sensitivities we're talking about <laughs> and, the, uh, and the weight uh, and things like that, we're talking about being much finer. Now, Rex, are you on? Do you wanna address how you handle density altitude? altitude? In a, in a Vertiport in Manhattan. Well, I've never flown in Manhattan, so uh, I have to uh, tell you that. Uh, I've flown at high altitudes in different DAs. Um, a lot of it goes into your performance planning. When you look at where you're going to fly, you look at the weather for the day and take in a consideration uh, what your weight of the aircraft is, what your environmental conditions are. Um, having flown in what you were talking about earlier, those areas with that large heat island. It is definitely something that you pay attention to when you come into urban environments. Going into Chicago in July, you you knew you were going to get turbulence off the buildings um, because of the differential in heating. It's I would say the bigger and heavier the aircraft, the less impact that has. The okay. smaller and lighter you are, the more impact you wind up having. Right. So we so we we're dealing with a. Um, a difference in, in capabilities of these aircraft and the fact that they're really going to be skinning down the weight of the airframes themselves because they're battery powered and they're going to be putting people on them and everything's going to be the tolerances are going to be a lot tighter the other thing is is uh they, the faa did perform some tests out in uh nevada it might have been upp1 now they think about it. i can't well that was nasa i uh, tcl4 and they did talk about in reno they were having problems with density altitude on top of the buildings flying those drones in in reno um because they were getting like 160 degrees at the skin right and uh, that was being a factor now these are things that you know can be worked through with infrastructure and 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 trying to use certain types of paint you know there's all kinds of things you could do right to mitigate it but 
the fact of the matter is, is I'm just trying to, you know, drive home the point that we're dealing with a different animal here that we've never had to deal with before. Okay, and uh, one last question that I have on here, Michael Split, and I'm going to let you ask because I can't quite make out what it's something about dollars for Uber resolution real time ops modeling. So if you could uh, decipher that for us there, Michael and. Uh, All the right, yeah, so, you know, and I don't know if this becomes a, a question of you target certain areas that are critical, but I mean, in some sense, we can't even afford a radio sound network that sends up two balloons a day at a very low resolution. And to have the kind of resolution we need for these, it would be, like you were saying, lots of dollars. Where What's going to drive all that money to be able to support that kind of need? Well, I, again, I think it's going to it's going to be we have to be innovative and we have to think outside the box about risk. And there are areas, you know, right now we built a system for air, for aircraft and manned aviation and a pretty standard system for um, observations that were based on specific cylinder areas of airspace. And we, you know, we kind of just have one system, right? We have helicopters also, and they've been kind of left behind at times, right? So we, we haven't even really done a good job with them. But part of that is because they're manned, they're flown by men and people, and they, you know, they could take a little bit more, right? So I guess we kind of accepted that as the price of business. We didn't really have the business model to drive major investments in things that we should have maybe. But in this case, um, you know, if you're flying drones and package delivery drones over, um, you know, upstate New York in a rural area, do you need the same observation network for safety purposes as you would need dry, flying people in a EV tall from Manhattan to JFK? Do you need to have the same level of uh, of quality of on observation for a package delivery versus a you know you know flying people? I think we just need to look at this a little differently. It has to be a risk-based framework. And then we need to then from there say, what's good enough, like we talked about earlier, for certain types of op operations. And then focus where we spend the dollars on where, you know, the 80-20 rule, where it needs to be spent, where risk is high, where you're flying over people, maybe high density corridors. And I think that's the way we have to take this on. And that, again, is where research could be money could be put in to look at that and figure out how to you know set it up so that we're spending you know we're not going to have unlimited money i mean we got we now got a three trillion dollar deficit you know so this is not going to get funded by the government i guarantee it it's going to have to come through business it's going to have to be incentivized municipalities people get uh, businesses and municipalities are gonna have to be incentivized in states to put up networks um it's going to have to be um pay for service it's going to have to, the money is going to have to flow back into the observing uh, whoever the owners of that data are. There has to be some incentive. Uh, that money will be funded through the UTM services and through the SDSPs who are buying the data from these, um, these businesses that are, or these municipalities and using it to build their products. They're going to have to pay a tax back to those guys. And then, um, you know, that's, that's the only way I could see this. It has to be, you know, it's going to have to be done differently than anything we've ever done before. Okay, well, if there's uh, no more questions, I'll uh, hand it back off to you, uh, uh, Matt or Gordy. This is Matt, over to Gordy. <laughs> okay, John, over to you. Sure. John, uh, John, wanted, to make, John wanted to make a comment. Nobody wants you. No, I was just going to mention that uh, I know we're you know, running, I don't know if we're running short on time. I'd like to uh, see if Chris uh, Bauer is ready and he's. Uh, wants to go up next. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I can. Uh, I could speak to my slide. Uh, first, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak, and um, want to thank everybody for their time. I'll I'll be brief. This won't be too long. Having ADD, I know what it's like to be chained to something for any length of time, um, and your mind starts to wander after a while and. I won't be repetitive. A lot of the points that have been made so far today, um, I would be in line with in terms of the need for weather, the cost of weather, how the weather is sourced, 
Um, there's a lot of uh, roadblocks to providing the weather. I thought that uh, Steve Dixon's comments were very timely, and I hope that we can maybe pull ourselves out of the doldrums where we've been for quite a while, where we're stuck with a monopoly of uh, vendors, and one in particular, you know, with a barrel sensor that no one else can seem to replicate based on a 1990s architecture um, that would allow us to move forward. From my purview, um, notwithstanding our involvement in the UTM community, but just to focus this slide on, on man flight, uh, we see that there's two flavors of basically a, a certified station and an advisory station, and either one should contain uh, cameras for advisory weather. We did a, a great project with the FAA many years ago um, where we put an automated station out in Southampton Heliport um, that contained cameras and ADS-B receiver as well as AWOS and um, put it on the internet so pilots could, could access it. And at the end of the project, the, the pilots were most impressed and enthusiastic about the weather cameras. And um, it was mentioned earlier, you know, that uh, um, I forgot who it was, gets calls at all hours of the day and night every time a bird, you know, lands on a camera or something. And, and, and that was one of my frustrations with this project was it seemed like right before a three day weekend in the Hamptons when they would be under assault from helicopters that one of the cameras or all of them would go offline for, uh, you know, a software glitch that was a, a, a quick fix, but, you know, just bad timing. So uh, technology today is better than what we had um, five, six years ago when we did the project and the cost has come down. So I think we can come up with a a much lower cost solution for camera advisory weather. We'd like to work in this project to create better certification criteria that recognizes the contemporary architecture of sensors. Um, so we're not more or less uh, stonewalled into using old legacy architecture um, and the maintenance costs that go with maintaining that architecture. And this way we can get more weather out to the system. If it, uh, if you have tried to source a VHF frequency from the FAA Spectrum Analysis Office. Good luck with that. The last one I did took um, three members, two members of Congress, a U.S. Senator, and a year before they were cut loose with one, and that was out, out in the middle of nowhere in the desert. Um, it doesn't seem that they have much of an appetite for releasing VHF frequencies, and for that reason, we're looking at providing better feeds um, either through ADSB in or in, in our own app. So we recently rolled out our own app where we can source weather and ultimately camera images, which could be pushed out to the pilots. Um, some of the other things that we're looking at with our cameras are just some other features involving uh, drone detection cameras uh, for crane detection, uh, a portable AWAS system that could be put in for periods of time where you may have, uh, particularly in the vertical flight community, operations going on where folks need weather. Um, I definitely agree with the statement that was made earlier that if you've got 10 miles of visibility, why does it have to be a certified um, system in that you don't need 10 miles of visibility to land in a 121 operation? I think that we've made this incredibly impossible and it doesn't need to be. And uh, the, the one word that you'll hear that comes up in everybody's presentation is cost. You know, who's going to pay for it? But if we make it so expensive and we make it so laborious um, that we can't get the pilots to the weather that they need, then we're doing everybody a disservice. So um, that's pretty much my presentation. Um, I'm always available offline if somebody has any questions about what we do. Um, and, and I guess I never said that in the beginning. So we're the we're an air navigation service provider. We develop, maintain, and implement the uh, GPS-based approaches that are used by airports, airlines, um, hospitals, helicopter operators, and governments worldwide. Thank you. Are there any questions for Chris? I see none online. We're going to let them off easy. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Yeah. And then, uh, Justin, are you available? Justin Hilliard? Yeah, I'm here. 
All right, you're up next. Okay, well, thanks for uh, the invite to participate in this. Uh, a lot of helpful information uh, across the board. Um, so again, I'm Justin Hilliard, work for UPS Flight Forward, which is the drone division of the parent company, UPS, uh, the big brown tails that you see flying around out there. I'm uh, one of the operations managers, and I'm also the chief meteorologist. Um, just celebrated my 15th anniversary at UPS last week. Um, kind of the success story where you start as a package handler and work your way up through the company. Um, before on this special assignment with the drone company, I was in the airline and supported the dispatchers directly uh, from our meteorology department there. So um, I've been tasked with what is now uh, micro weather is kind of what everybody is referring to it as um, to go along with our drone company. So just a little bit about what we are doing at UPS right now. Um, so as it was mentioned earlier, the normal drone operations fall under the part 107 reg. Um, there's a lot of limitations there and a lot of things you need to get waivers for in order to, to do, and it really makes it impossible uh, to fly as a package handler under those regs um, due to the fact mostly because you can't fly for hire with packages under that regulation. But also there's limitations such as flight over people, over moving vehicles, beyond visual line of sight, uh, and again, the package transport for hire. Um, so what we did at UPS is we went in and we said, OK, let's fly as a part 135 cargo airline instead. How do we do that? And we went into every single reg under 135 and we petitioned the FAA for exemptions for each one of those items that either didn't apply to the drones or we needed to do it in a different way. Um, I was one of the five riders that was on the team for that petition for exemption, and we essentially created an entire operating plan um, in that petition for exemption, new op specs, and then went out and validated our training program, um, validated actually flying the aircraft, just like a check ride would be on a private pilot ride or, or any other type of certificate that you would get, uh, and then got that approved through the FAA. Um, so we were the first fully certified. Uh, I know Google Wing they got a partial part 135 certification uh, about a week before or a month before us. Um, but ours allows us flight over people or moving vehicles. The big one there is beyond line of sight. That's probably the hardest um, to get right now. Um, and what we're actually doing is our market right now is the medical field um, and especially could come in very handy right now with all the uh, COV-19 stuff. Um, but what we do is we take off from a hospital location where you might go in for a routine test. Um, they take some blood or a urine sample, uh, but you're at a satellite hospital. You're not at the main hospital where they do the testing. So a ground courier would normally show up, pick up that sample, might be six hours later before they get your sample actually to the lab to be tested. Um, so we go on the hour or on the half hour, depending on the morning or the afternoon, and we fly uh, nonstop throughout the day. Uh, right now, I think we're doing, I wanna say 16 flights per day at Wake Med in Raleigh, North Carolina. So on the Eastern side of town there. So we take the specimen that needs testing, we fly it to the hospital where the main lab is that does the testing. You get a fast turnaround um, for the patient. So you get your results faster as the customer of the hospital. The lab itself doesn't get overwhelmed when that courier shows up every six hours and dumps the entire city's worth of samples on them at one time. And of course, the carbon footprint, um, you reduce those trucks driving around the city. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh -oh. See you may have to hit play on there. Oh, there it goes. So this is uh, just so you can get a little bit more of a visual um, of what we did. It's like a 30 second video so you can see what the drone looks like and the little brown box on there. We don't have a whole lot of uh, PR stuff out there right now just because we're we're so focused on the expansion um, that we're waiting till we get some more locations to really to hit that hard. Um, so what is our challenge? It's how do we acquire accurate, certified, or acceptable weather briefings? Next slide. So challenges uh, that, that we're seeing right now as a 135 operator is any new operations. Again, this is a 
daily operation that we do Monday through Friday. This is not a test or practice. This is an actual certified operation that we're doing each day. Um, but to get set up at first for safety concerns, the UAS launch points by nature are being kept away from airports. The closer you get to an airport, the higher the risk hazard. And without proven data, it takes longer uh, to get closer to the airports and closer to the main aircraft. Um, so as we increase our flight numbers, uh, I want to say we have just in 2020, uh, somewhere around 1,100 flights that we've done at Wake Med, um, probably close to 3,000 since we started this in the beginning, um, under 107 practice transitioning in September to the Part 135. Um, but until we get those numbers increased, uh, we won't be able to get closer to the airports. And so the challenge for weather that presents is if you think of a terminal area forecast, um, you're looking at five miles radius of that location. So the AWOS or ASOS OBS that are out there right now are technically not valid for places that we're flying. Next slide. So I want to show you, uh, this is Wake Med in North Carolina, down in Raleigh. Uh, circled in red there is the actual hospital location. It's marked by the little uh, heart symbol there just to the southwest of it. And to show you a density of the AWOS or ASOS stations, uh, anything marked with the W on this map is an AWOS ASOS. Uh, so the closest location that we have is Raleigh-Durham over there to the northwest. It's 13 miles from our spot. Uh, we've got Franklin County Airport up to the northeast there, almost 22 miles away, and Johnston County Airport down there to the southeast, almost 20 miles away. Um, so you can see on here that our particular application, uh, we don't have a good valid weather observation to go off of um, based off of just the spread of where they are here. So on the next slide, you'll see where NC State has some of their weather stations set up. And while these are not certifiable weather stations, um, you would tend to trust a, a university driven program a lot more than just your your average citizen out there who sticks a weather station in the back backyard. Um, they've got pretty good coverage along the interstate there. But again, if you look at where Wake Med is there marked with the red dot, uh, the closest weather station that we have there is that one that's showing 18 miles per hour there just to the southwest. And that's about six miles away from us there. So still not a great solution uh, outside of the five miles again. Uh, on the next slide, I've got the personal weather stations all around all of Raleigh there. So this is a little more zoomed in than what we were showing before just to show the density. Raleigh Durham up there in the far northwest corner, top left, uh, and then Wake Med Hospitals almost in the center, just a little to the east there with the blue dot or the little red cross. And one of the things you notice even here uh, is that the concentration of weather stations in that sort of bottom right quadrant is next to nothing. Uh, so we have no data that's really near uh, the hospital out there. Um, so kind of to compare that to our next site that we will be flying at that we uh, are approved to go to, we just haven't started yet, is out in Salt Lake City in Utah at University of Utah Health. The little green push pin there labeled with Huntsman is our uh, takeoff and landing site. Uh, along the front range of the mountains there. You can see Salt Lake City marked with the W on that map. That's our ASOS, it's the closest one. Um, seven miles for that. And then the next closest down there to the south uh, is about 10 miles away from us. I didn't label that one other than the W. And then of course, Hill Air Force Base way up at the very top of the screen there, 26 miles away. So a lot less concentration here and anyone who has actually been out and flown in terrain like this with the mountains knows that there is a significant change anytime you get that close to the front range. And another factor on this one is even that seven mile away weather station, it sits almost a thousand feet lower in elevation than the site where we're taking off and landing from there. So let's look at uh, University of Utah's weather network which is on the next slide here. And this is Meso West. There we go. Um, Huntsman is labeled on there with the red dot again. Um, and then the red dot that's just south of the H down there is the, the second site that would be flying to and from just to give you a better idea of the path. Uh, for reference again, Salt Lake City is up in the top left of that shot. 
Um, but you'll notice there's about eight weather stations um, that are less than one mile away from our actual flight route there. This, this entire route from A to B is about three miles or so. Um, so again, not a certified weather station, but going out of a university weather network, um, we do have a history that we can pull out of these just to uh, go in and actually pull historical data and, and kind of get an idea of the climate setup and the trends. Uh, and then we can also pull the, the daily hourly weather there. Um, so helpful. Um, kind of interesting out on in Salt Lake, though, is the comparison of the university network to what the personal weather stations look like, which is on the next slide. And compared to Raleigh, um, not very dense at all on the coverage here. Um, the agreement, just looking at the wind data that they have on this one, looks a little bit better. Um, but that's an interesting point to talk about, too, is that as a UAS operator, I don't want the overall wind trend at the surface when I'm talking about my takeoff and landing sites because I want to know where's the wind at that actual location where I take off and land. Uh, the in route, a lot of times you can get a better trend or a better idea of that. But at the surface, the other slide that had Raleigh on there, the wind was every single direction at every one of those weather stations that was out there. And to us as a drone operator, that would be a, a more important, um, but it may skew the overall data that the National Weather Service or Don or somebody else that's inputting, um, you know, the traditional weather that we look at from an airport. So you go to the next slide. So the, the points here, it really matches along with everything that everybody's talked to. Um, ASOS, AWOS, too sparse for drone coverage. Uh, also too expensive to duplicate. That's the biggest hurdle right now is uh, Don's ballpark figure trying to get it down to around $10,000 per site um, would be a little bit tempting to companies like UPS as far as us supplying weather stations for our locations. Um, but anything more than that, um, if you want ceiling to be included in that, some of the cheapest sealometers that I've seen out there so far, just looking around, sixteen to eighteen thousand dollars just for the sealometer by itself. So we got to come up with a better way to do that. Um, the university-sponsored weather stations lack visibility and ceiling in most cases, but they are typically quality checked. Um, so the data could be certified if that was loosened a little bit to where um, university personnel could be trained to go out and actually do the certifications themselves instead of having to have National Weather Service personnel out there. Um, the personal weather stations usually have a lot more dense coverage. Again, they lack the certifiable data. Um, somebody was talking about the siting requirements earlier. Again, that's kind of strange for us because if we take off right in front of a hospital building, we want to know what's happening right in front of the hospital building. We don't want to know what's happening on the roof of the hospital building um, because our highest risk uh, assessment says that the takeoff and landing, the ascent descent from our landing location is the most dangerous. Um, so that data to us in that hover situation while the drones ascending or descending is the most important. Um, not to say that we couldn't put a multi sensor where we have one on the roof and one at the surface at the takeoff site uh, that would provide helpful. But as far as our risk assessment goes, the takeoff and landing is just like any other aircraft uh, out there flying is the most important part. Um, the weather cameras, you can use AI to determine visibility and sky coverage, uh, much more cost effective than all the normal instruments out there. We've talked about those. So on to the next slide here, um, hammering home the weather camera network up in Alaska. This is a snapshot that I took yesterday uh, from Chickaloon. Forgive me if that's said wrong there. Um, so on the top right corner there, you can see markers, um, little bullet points on different peaks of the, the terrain around there and then the river basin. Um, and on those markers, they give you a mean sea level elevation and they also give you a distance from the camera. So in this particular shot, looking at that looks like gloom and doom, um, but I've got clear visibility out to one mile before it definitely starts to get foggy. Uh, and then down in the river basin, you can actually make out the water there pretty well too. So we're probably, somewhere in the five to seven mile range overall in that shot. Um, so a lot of information can be pulled from this um, just by taking a look at this, this quick weather shot right here. Um, go ahead on the next one. So 
how do we brief our pilots today and how do they get good information? Um, to start out the program, we chose to only use commercially rated pilots, and this is not part 107. This is actually manned aviation. Uh, most of them are helicopter pilots or former military um, with drone experience. Um, so we know and trust that their level of expertise is already up to a standard that the FAA approves of um, without going into the 107 world where the weather training is just not, it's, it's substandard under 107. Um, so our crew members, when they come in for initial training, um, then they also come back through recurrent training. We put them through a meteorology class that was approved by the FAA, uh, and it's derived off of the E-WINS type class, which goes through nearly everything, but then adapted over to drones where um, certain atmospheric phenomena do not affect the drones because of the altitude that they fly at. Um, for now, we're using the closest terminal aerodome forecast for their official briefing. Uh, if they have any questions or concerns or maybe the forecast is kind of borderline and they need to make a, a more educated decision than just going off the TAF, um, they'll give me a call in the meteorology department and then I'll use resources that are available to me, available to me from both the airline. Um, one of the unique items that we'll use is the, the AMDAR data. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but uh, not just UPS, but a couple of the other airlines out there have instruments on a couple of their aircraft that give a uh, vertical sounding at takeoff and landing that's proprietary to each one of the airlines. And then we show that with each other. And that data actually goes back into the numerical models to help improve them. So a lot of times I can get a, a wind profile out of Raleigh on a, a Delta or Southwest or somebody that takes off out of there, or of course, UPS plane and uh, help those guys see a little bit better what the winds look like. <clears throat> and then on site, we do provide the crew members with training um, and calibrated anemometers so that they can make their ultimate final go, no-go decision uh, based off what they're actually seeing there. Next slide. So the big thing here, um, from what I've experienced, just going through testing and validation and um, trying to find a solution for this, with micro weather is that until we have more input like we've talked about today uh, the computer models just cannot do the output um, so you get the data from all the different types of sources whether it's ground stations um, we could incorporate something like the amdar we have on our aircraft but pull that weather data in from the drones now instead um, get more boundary layer information even if that's just a wind speed wind direction at altitudes under 500 feet or in the future if the drones fly higher um, cell phone towers cell phones radar satellite boats you name it there's data out there that can be brought in but we need to figure out a way to ingest that data to increase the models uh, the the terrain modeling is good and it is definitely more helpful than not having it um, where you increase the terrain resolution and then run that against the models um, but it's just not uh, a solution out there that's where we would like to see it at this point Go ahead. So the, the key so, to this is we need to find the cost effective, um, but also accurate solution. You know, without the accuracy, the price doesn't matter. But if the price is too big, then it doesn't matter either. So um, thanks for your time and go ahead to some questions if you want. Thanks, uh, thanks Justin. Uh, Justin. There's a couple of questions, couple of questions that we have here. Um, and I think that uh, you may have answered one from Paul Hepner about uh, TAFs. Uh, do, does the uh, weather department there in Louisville generate any special tasks for the drones? But I believe what you were saying is that they just use the nearest <clears throat> regular TAF. Is that correct? Or are there That's any special? Uh, we don't actually write any TAFs ourselves. Um, and it sort of comes from a, a liability standpoint that UPS prefers to use the official published tasks out there so that um, we we can be accused of rewriting things in order to help our business out. And, and as a follow on Paul's asking uh, what grounds the drones like are there uh, what, what's the minimums for ceiling and visibility uh, that you would have? Yeah, you can uh, you can actually go out to the Federal Register website and you can look at our entire exemption that we applied for out there. Um, just Google UPS Part 135 exemption. 
Um, specific weather limitations we have right now, three mile visibility, uh, 1000 foot ceiling, sustained winds at 15 knots and gusts of 23 uh, and no precipitation, no icing. And what, what size or weight uh, are, are these typically? Um, the overall size are about two feet by two feet um, and the max takeoff weights around 30 pounds. And um, Don uh, Birchoff says in 10 years, how many UPS drone flights in a day in the US uh, do y'all estimate? I, I wish I could estimate that number for you, but uh, your guess is good as mine on that one. All right. Um, Jeff Massey, do you have a long term solution that doesn't involve deploying uh, your own stations? Uh, and he's saying at Prime Air, they um, stand by. I'm trying to get the little smiley faces out of the way here. At Prime Air, <laughs> they have a very similar challenge. And it's hard to trust the uh, media data from the other mesonets. Uh, and latency can also create an issue with five minute a AWAS and 10 minute plus delayed then. Yeah, so um, the UPS airline meteorology department didn't exist until around 1995. And the reason that came about was there was a blizzard that came through Louisville, Kentucky at our world port hub where we do all the sorting for next day packages um, that was unpredicted. And the local meteorologist completely screwed up the forecast worse than you can imagine. And we got between 16 and 23 inches uh, in a 24 hour period and it completely devastated the whole city, shut the whole place down. And there was uh, our chief meteorologist now in the airline um, was working for a different company and happened to be in our ops center that day. And he just threw out the idea, hey, uh, I think y'all are gonna have a bad snowstorm coming up. And they're like, oh no, they said four to six inches or so. Um, and then it turned into six to eight inches and it was 10 to 12 inches and it was 14 to 18 and, and so on. And um, so they approached him uh, the next day after everything completely fell apart and they said, hey, how would you like to start a weather department for us? Um, and to go back to his question, um, probably the same as Prime Air. We don't we don't trust anyone else to do our weather for us. Um, so the answer right now, do we have a long term uh, solution is no, we don't. Um, but for uh, the purposes like this call um, and all the people that are working in this industry to come up with one, uh, that that's that's what we're looking for right now ourselves is what is long term and then some other people in the the last or in Don's presentation talking about how the the crew members have to be able to understand the weather in order to make it useful. Um, that's another big challenge for us too. Um, so the end user here is our remote pilot in command that we have out there. So we we do need an application that is simplified enough at their level that they can use. And that's kind of the route that we're going at UPS is to separate um, the pilot application from the forecaster application and have a good distinguished uh, line between what the two of those give out. All right, and uh, John over MBAA says you showed personal weather stations. Did you take a look at DOT stations if present and uh, was access uh, an issue if not? Yeah, so the um, North Carolina DOT is a partner in the integration pilot program. Um, they're actually kind of heading up North Carolina's program for that. So they've made available anything, any resources that they have to us, um, at least through the end of October this year, which is when the uh, IPP is supposed to end. Um, I looked through their weather cameras or their, their road cameras that they have, and most of the road cameras they have are pointed downward. Um, there's not a lot of good shots of the sky, just in the media area of our wake med operation there, um, looking along the corridor of the interstate, there was one camera out of about five that actually had a shot that was far enough away to be able to make out uh, some type of terrain or, or structure in the distance. So um, I think it would take some rearranging of the cameras, but I don't see why we couldn't incorporate that. And uh, Rocky Stone, uh, do you, um see a need for a UAS weather data link standards. Sounds like an SC206 question here, uh, such as those that exist for manned aircraft. Uh, yeah, and then he says SC206 has been considering uh, if there is an industry need for such a standard. 
Yeah, I think there there absolutely is because until that happens, we don't have a way of proving um, that any type of data out there is worthy of what the UAS pilot needs. Um, so that would go back to, to Don again with the ASTM subgroup that we're looking at to help um, not necessarily set those rules, but test those rules and then establish kind of a baseline for where we think a good starting point is. All righty, and uh, John Stevenson um, had a comment. John, why don't you go ahead and speak to that? It was a, a pretty lengthy a comment there, and I think there may be a question with there too. Uh, did sure. you want to speak to that? Yes, um, and just to mention it, you know, takeoff and landings are the most critical phases of flight, and also in Don's briefing, they talked about, uh, you know, having sufficient power. So my question is, do these UAS, or do they have performance pointing charts available to do an assessment to know that they have the, the uh, necessary power at takeoff, at IG, OG, at both arrival and destination? Because if, if they don't have that level of, of performance pointing charts or certification level of, their, of that aircraft, how can you know what the, your max load will be for your package that you're going to take? Or do you understand the question? Yeah, so there's there's kind of two answers to that. Um, the overall answer is yes, there is performance data that's out there. Um, what we're finding is the best way to do, because it kind of ties into your weight and balance issues uh, with the aircraft, is that the manufacturers have found a max payload weight and they've kept it within a certain CG. And between the two of those, that kind of sets um, where inside of that CG that maximum weight can shift. Um, if that was, uh, say, a, a steel ball that you have inside of your aircraft and fly with that. Um, so they determine um, a max payload weight with inside uh, the cargo box um, versus recalculating a weight and balance for every flight um, different to that cargo that's on board. Um, they've certified or they're going through the type certification of the aircraft now. Um, right now, we're not type certified, um, but we plan to be uh, in the future here. So um, we have a flight manual, we have a maintenance manual, we have everything you would see in a normal Part 135 operation um, to get that data um, that you're asking about. Sure, and then the other question, I guess, was can these drones experience settling with power like a helicopter, manned helicopter can? And with this Urban Canyon uh, problem, I can see that could be a significant issue. And, and what are the mitigations for that? Yeah, so um, one of the big questions that people had in the beginning was uh, ascent and descent. Why couldn't we descend faster uh, when we're over the landing point? And people don't realize you can you can stall a helicopter out in a descent when you sit on that column of air that's sinking uh, and you sink faster than, than it can. Um, so we do have uh, performance built into the manuals and whatnot um, for for that data. So it is certainly a hazard for the drone, just like it would be for a helicopter. OK, thanks. That's all I had. And uh, Mike Robinson's asking if uh, UPS uh, Flight Forward is considering adding onboard weather sensors to the drone platform to increase local weather uh, awareness that could eventually be fed in the models decision support, uh, particularly at, as UPS scales up its commercial drone operations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right now we're focused on the actual business and the expansion. Uh, it, it will take some time to be profitable in this um, to a point to where uh, we have that the extra dollars to hopefully spend towards the weather instrumentation. Um, but the other challenge there is, as I mentioned, the type certification. Once these aircraft are type certified, they have to conform to those um, specs. So for us to add anything to them, we can't physically modify the aircraft without going through that type certification again. And because the drones are so small, it's a lot different than uh, sticking a sensor on the outside of the fuselage of an aircraft. Um, but yes, we're, we're absolutely looking at uh, collecting weather data and, and dispersing that just like we do with our, our brown tails. And, and so, and then this is from me, not Mike, but is the uh, process of doing a supplementary type certificate, you said it, it's, it's it, it's much or it's more difficult because of the size of the aircraft. Is it a similar process or, or have you all gone down that uh, path yet? 
Yeah, so the, the type certification is actually done by the manufacturer and not by the operator. Um, so the, the way that we fly our drones right now is we actually purchase them just like as if um, a Boeing was to sell us an aircraft to use. So Boeing would be responsible for that type certification. Um, there's other smaller ways around that, um, such as getting a cargo payload approved that might have the weather sensors in that. Um, because as long as that meets the CG requirements of the aircraft, it's technically not part of the aircraft. It's a, a cargo container being attached to it. Um, so we're looking at all the different ways to, to go that route, but um, the manufacturer would have to go back through the type certification if we wanted to modify the aircraft. Okay, so there's not really the avenue to have a third party, it sounds like at this point. Um, Correct. Do a supplementary. Uh, Rex is asking, are you considering how to account for vertical turbulence? Uh, in other words, updrafts, downdrafts, particularly in the urban environments and around buildings. Yeah, so right now um, our, our wind limitations are pretty restrictive as far as the overall wind speed and uh, a lot goes actually into our route planning process. I can't go into a full detail on that um, just because of NDA things, but um, our, our route goes through an extensive process of analysis of what we're flying over in order to get that route approved. And then we can only fly that route. We can make no modifications to that at this point without going back through the FAA approval process. How, how, uh, how rapid is that FAA approval process for a route? Is that fairly um, tactical or is that something that has to be uh, laid out like hours or days ahead of time? Um, at the fastest, I would say weeks and probably closer to about two to three months. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, all right, and when, uh, uh, Corey Gimpler, uh, do you have a backup weather data available if local, for instance, Mesonet data is out of service? Um, so we haven't had that issue yet. Um, we do use the, the, like I said, the Raleigh Durham Airport is our main source for that Wake Med site. Um, so while it does happen, the likelihood of the the TAF at that airport to go down um, is not too likely. Um, as far as certifiable data, there's really not any other sources around that area for us to use. Um, we do use the commercial pilots there. So if you try to compare us, the best comparison is the helicopters. If uh, a helicopter pilot would feel comfortable uh, making that flight, most of our guys are ex-helicopter pilots uh, and we trust them to make the, the go no-go, um, so long as it's not a close weather situation where maybe you're at 1,200 feet or 1,100 feet, you can't tell if you're at the 1,000 or, or your visibility is close. But on a fair weather day, um, it's best to compare us to a helicopter pilot. Uh, and Don Eck was asking if you've had any drones lost or down to due to weather and what happens if uh with the lab samples uh or like hazmat yeah we we have not had any uh incidents or accidents uh at wake med at our operation there um as far as the hazmat uh response to that uh it'd be similar to like a, a dot response um you know locate where the aircraft went down try to quarantine off the area or, or block the area. Uh, most of these are not for infectious disease type testing. Um, so we're not as concerned, but like any bloodborne pathogens, um, you know, you never know it could be in, in somebody's blood. Um, so we would respond to it just like you would any type of other, uh, if the courier was to get into an accident. Um, but the other, the other sort of misconception and, and view that everyone has right now is that if a drone goes down there's a catastrophic disaster because an aircraft just crashed but it's hard to compare a 30 pound drone that's two foot by two foot with a, a lithium battery in it um, to uh, even a Cessna 172 with four people in it um, the the level of disaster that occurs there is much different um, than than just a drone crashing into a tree or into a, a parking lot okay and uh have you uh, thought about running, this is from Michael Split, have you thought about running weather surveying drones uh, along your routes? I guess um, Pathfinder. Yeah, we we have considered, uh, so for 
us to actually operate the drones and probably not. Um, we do fly empty legs occasionally to position or deposition our drones. And we've considered on that leg the possibility of installing uh, a payload on there that does weather sensing uh, to catch data in between those non-revenue legs. All right, well, um, I think that was all of the questions. Was there any more from, from the group for Justin? Matt, you're back on the air. Uh, well, let me let me. Uh, since this is the last um, panel, last presentation and conversation in Gordy's session, let me actually hand it over to Gordy to to wrap this thing up, and then we'll take our final break. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone, and we really appreciate all the good discussion and and feedback that we've gotten. I think we've got a pretty good idea about where the industry is going, the UAS industry is going. As far as uh, the the challenges that they're faced with, uh, appreciate uh, Don Birchoff for his uh, for his excellent presentation and 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 candor on on what his thoughts are. Certainly, um, uh, Don has um, uh, some some great ideas, and there's some there's some definite potential there. The the how is the big piece of this. I mean, how are we going to make all this happen? Is is a big challenge, especially since. A lot of uh, a lot of regulation uh, is non-existent uh, in the certification world and in the operating world uh, under 107 and and 135 was just really never designed for unmanned nor was 121 so changes in the future I'm sure will come down but um, it gives uh, us in the FAA Kevin uh, uh, primarily and, and those in ANG C6 ideas on uh, directions to go with uh, um, the gap analysis. So we really appreciate everybody uh, joining in. Um, that This has been great. And uh, any last minute comments? Okay, I guess hearing none, um, back to you, Matt, as far as the uh, wrap up, or I guess we're gonna go over to uh, uh, we got one more session left. Yeah, we're going to take a break uh, for not quite 15 minutes or until 4.40. Uh, and then uh, Steve Dar is going to update us on some of the ADSB weather um, um, changes, really exciting changes that that uh, that have happened uh, since the last time we met at FPA. And, and Matthias and I will bring us home with some FPA updates and then we'll Whew, take a breath and say we're done. So in the meantime, until 4.40, um, do what you need to do. I 